So, everybody, welcome to the Triratna Buddhist Centre, the Sydney Buddhist Centre of the Triratna Buddhist Community. And today I have the honour of presenting Triratna Day. And I'm going to tell an untold history of Triratna in pictures. There are many things that are told and told frequently. And I wanted to share the spirit of Tri Ratna in a particular way with you today. I'm not going to talk very much about historical events. Those are all very easily Googleable. I was really inspired by this quote by Susan Sontag, the activist and writer and journalist. The painter constructs, the photographer discloses. Though I suspect Arya Dharma might disagree with me on that. <laughs> You don't disagree. Susan Sontag. Yeah, it's, she's a bit. <laughs> if anyone knows anything about Susan Sontag, uh, Sontag uh, she has a very diverse and fascinating life. So most of the, what you're going to see comes from the new Tree Retina Picture Library, which you can access, which is a very comprehensive history of Tree Retina, uh, and also pre Tree Retina times, and also slightly older, uh, good old Flickr. I did some dredging through Flickr. The proposition I put to myself in putting this together was what inspires someone to participate in our community? What do we actually practice? And if it's hard for you to read, how does it feel to participate? And the colour choices are significant, of course. The purpose was to illuminate unfamiliar histories to celebrate our diverse cultures and to reveal our common values. Now there were parameters I set for myself. At least one image from each decade. They had to be candid, unposed and authentic. So there are no photos of lots of people standing smiling in front of shrines. There's lots of those that one can find. Uh, there's possibly one that's slightly more posed. I wonder if you could spot it. And I wanted it to reflect the order itself, the Buddhist order that we belong to, those who wear the kesa, and also the wider community. Now, the perspectives I'm offering, each picture, you may see much more than I. Okay? And history always reflects the values and perspectives of the historian. So you'll probably get a little bit of insight into the way I see Tree Ratna. This may not be how you see Tree Ratna. And lastly, it is important to acknowledge that not every story can be told, uh, particularly around some of our uh, microcultures that exist within Tree Ratna. So there's no exclusion as intentional, uh, but I do acknowledge that there's always going to be bias when anyone presents any particular perspective. Okay, now the first photo may come as something of a shock. So I'm going to give you a trigger warning. Now, I'm going to be reading the photos. I'm not really going to be telling you very much about what's going on. That said, this is a man called Ananda. And this photo was taken in the year I was born, 1968. It's really interesting that he's in an oddly Christ-like posture. This particular image uh, was taken on a retreat, and for me it speaks of freedom. It speaks of the promise of being free that Tri Ratna offers the world. It arrived at a particular juncture in time when old systems were becoming irrelevant, and new ways of seeing the world were becoming more experimental and questioning of long-established values. And I think at the early years, in 1968, we saw a burgeoning of this kind of freedom, expression and experiment in both the wider Western world, but particularly in the, what was then the Western Buddhist order. This particular photo could be one of ecstatic freedom, yeah, but it could also be the kind of expression one has when one meets incredible pain. And I think it's important to realise that when we practice in this tradition, we're meeting both sides of ourselves. 
we're meeting that which is painful and difficult, and we have that promise of freedom and expression, free expression, and opening up to something more beautiful as he's opening his chest. No, just not raining. <laughs> so this is also taken, I think, in the same year. There's some very, dis very distinctive emphases of Tree Ratna here. Tea. <coughs> Books. An openness to, one would hope, blue skies. This particular order member, uh, and unfortunately I don't have my full notes in front of me, He's one of the very few order members who wasn't named in Sanskrit or Pali. He was actually named after one of William Blake's angels. And I think that's really interesting that within a Buddhist movement, the founder of that movement wanted to expand open the idea of what it means to take on a spiritual name and a spiritual tradition. And he opened it up into a Blake, one of Blake's angel figures. This particular one speaks to me of the fact that we are a contemplative community. We're a community that, yes, we're bookish. Yes, we love our cups of tea. But we also just like to contemplate that which is beautiful in nature and that which is beautiful in ourselves and that which is beautiful and spacious in other people. So we are a contemplative community. And an experimental one. Tell us his name. I could if I could see my notes. I think uh -huh. it's Yuval. Uh -huh. I think it's Yuval. I do apologize if okay. I have that wrong. I'll, uh, if I have that wrong, uh, in the video recording, I'll it correct it on Luva. screen. Sorry? Luva. It might be Luva. Yes, it's you're right. It is Luva. Thank you. Luva Thank you. Or Ritra, but no, it is Luva. Thank you. Thank you. That is correct because I remember that from my notes. Thank you. Did you know him, Damamati? Yeah. yeah. Ah. Thank you, Luva. Luva. Does anybody know who this is? <laughs> and Manichita, who's this? Dhamma Dinna. Dhamma Dinna. This was taken in 1980. Now, before we start looking at the sort of possible gendered interpretation of this image, <laughs> yes, we are looking at a woman doing the ironing. <laughs> <laughs> But it's what she's ironing that's important. So this is Dhammadina, who I believe at this point was uh, both a preceptor. Was she a public preceptor in 1980? No, she was a private preceptor. Though. Oh no, there wasn't, right, because we have Banti. So we have Dhammadina here, who is uh, you know, an, a very significant person in our community. I've met her numerous times, and I adore her Dharma talks. But here she is at a, uh, before an ordination doing what is needed to be done. Behind her on the wall is a list of duties and rosters and responsibilities. And here she is, ironing cases, making them perfect and ready for what needs to be done. And I think that's, we're actually a very practical community. We do what needs to be done. Back in the early years of the movement, uh, Sangharachita would be the one making the sandwiches and making the tea before giving the very long Dharma talk and running the puja into the evening. So we don't sit back and wait for other people to do our work for us. As a community, we are there to make sure what needs to be done is done, whether it's gendered activity or not. How are we traveling so far? Is this all a bit intense too, too soon? Oh, it's great. Okay. Also, I love her jumper. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing about this is the fact the door's shut. For some reason, that says to me, but this is a significant time, a significant place separate from other things. This is a practice as much as it is a job that needs to be done. The rest of the world is outside. I apologize for the man spread. <laughs> this is a young Sabuti, another significant order member. This is 1978 we're in now. And he's reading a collection of, of uh, Aphorisms written by Sankaracha. It's called Peace is a Fire, if you can't read it. Once again, outdoors. Once again, not raining. 
The expression on his face is what I really want to focus on. It's intense. We are actually a, an order that is very intense. Trivatna is not a hobby. The kind of Buddhism we offer isn't that nice thing you go to on a Saturday morning. We actually want you to engage with the practice like a fire. We want it to burn. We want you to purify and have it enter into all parts of your life, not just having a bit of uh, relaxation on a Saturday morning. There is an intensity to what we do, and if you decide to become more involved and you decide to uh, become a mitra, as we have people becoming today, joining our community and wanting to practice and be a Buddhist in our community, you do need to have a sense of intensity, and you need to keep that intensity alive, because that will sustain you and change you over time. And he, of course, has been a great force for intense change, both in the West and in the East in India. Yeah. Oh, how could I forget the Romani people? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we tend to not use that word anymore, I believe. Yeah, the, the Romani people in Hungary are really opening up the Dharma to them, a very dispossessed and, and um, yeah, a, a, a people who feel quite powerless. So the Dharma is being opened up to them with the intensity that they can take forward and have momentum moving forward. Thank you, Nagashuri. Now, I did have to pause when I selected this photo for a little while. Uh, that's actually Nag uh, that's Nagabodhi. Um, I, I confess, I confess before, before you all, it's a very attractive photo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, kn he knows, we've had this conversation. <laughs> uh, this is on a study retreat, and what I love about it is the vignette effect around the outside. You've got this kind of vagueness You've got this sort of vague blurriness around the outside. And then you've got this incredibly piercing intensity, again, that intensity of Nagabodhi. And that's, in a sense, because we are thinkers. We're wanting you to think for yourself. Sangharachita wants you to think your thoughts, unravel your thoughts, see the illusion of your thoughts, make better thoughts that help you and other people. He's not asking any of us to think his thoughts. He wants you to think for yourself and know for yourself, as the Buddha did. Don't just believe what you are told by someone who says they are wise, or someone who may be older in the order than you, or someone who'd be more, who might have been around longer than you. Test it out for yourself. Think it for yourself. That's Deva Mitra in the foreground. Following on from that, and I love the way their eyes are all angled in exactly the same kind of way, pointed to the words. We're very studious. We have a lot of things to study. But not only do we study a lot, we study breadth. Many other Buddhist traditions take a very slim volume of teaching as their core. Now, there's great value in that, to be honest, because one can feel very overwhelmed in Tri Ratna by the range and the breadth from we can read suttas and we can read... Uh, the Tibetan uh, Book of the Dead, and we can read Mahayana Sutras, and we can read commentaries and, and, and seminars on commentaries on original yeah. texts. And then we can listen to free Buddhist audio where we're talking about Mahamudra or we're talking about Satipatthana, and there's so much going on, right? You can feel overwhelmed. But think your own thoughts. Have intensity. Find what actually works for you and for the benefit of others. And Sri Ratna offers that. Through that breadth, you have an opportunity to develop a focus. Wow. The projection is not giving that justice. The colours uh, and the details you can't see, unfortunately. Through the window, we have a vegetarian restaurant run by the order and the movement. And this is a, I don't know, would you call it a bric-a-brac shop? A junk shop? Second-hand goods? A gift shop? A gift shop, even? Although this is particularly this is second-hand materials here. This is, a, uh, there's an order member there. Uh, again, I don't have her name with us, unfortunately. But we have people's leftovers. <laughs> people's pasts. 
being repurposed. Isn't that what we do? Aren't we, in a sense, repurposing our past? We're transforming who we are, what we have, what we've got, and we're learning to pass it on, but also to let it go. To renounce, but to do so lovingly. None of these lamps have been smashed on the ground with, you know, be gone, smash. <laughs> you know, it is offered up to someone, to this shop, to be sold to someone else who needs it. Yeah. So all of us are here in a process of transformation, honouring the past, letting go of the past, but doing so in a, a process of kindly change and transformation. It's right up there, you probably can't see it, there's some fantastic pink lips <laughs> stuck to the wall. I don't know who would have that on their wall, but amazing. <laughs> yeah. Lots of lamps to illuminate the way. And rainbows. Lots of rainbows. Now, when I first saw this, I thought this was something out of Chernobyl. <laughs> it looked like I thought it was like the core of a nuclear reactor. This is actually a candle factory from the 1980s that was running out of Padmaloka, one of our retreat centres. And uh, it's really interesting the way in which the candles are hanging and the way that they're arranged in such order, uh, all seated in their rows. And I love the fact that we've got the three jewels represented here by these three barrels. Yeah? And a white barrel for purity and the white barrel for our casa, perhaps. Uh, this is an innovative. This is really innovative. This is an, an, a, a group of people wanting to survive and fund and support a community, a, a retreat centre, so that they could bring more people to practice. And so by selling candles, which one could, of course, decorate one's shrine with and illuminate uh, your home, you have the opportunity to fund an, a place for people to meditate and to grow. And from uh, his greater lamp, a lesser lamp we light within us comes to mind with this too. Great opportunity taken with that one. Tamamati, were you involved at all in that? Did you know much about it? Yes, yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've made a few candles for him. So. <laughs> yes, you've certainly lit a few candles too. Yes. Both literally and mm. metaphorically. Nietzsche Mukta apparently almost burnt Padmaloka down in the candle mm. factory. Yes, that's another untold history that we're not going to cover today. Thank you, Damalasa, for that. Yeah. yeah. I love this photo. Uh, I don't know if you again can quite grasp the, the details of it. We have some astonishing hammer pants there. Uh, this is in 1990. And uh, we've got a whole saxophone solo which is sort of much more sort of 80s vibe going on we've got a drummer we've got this amazing kind of pat benatar wouldn't look out of out of place wearing those kind of leather or vinyl outfits um and you've got this man curiously dressed man um i mean no disrespect but really the the checked shirt and the jacket just don't quite go um and he sort of looks bemused as to what's going on um this, this, this was actually on a, um, an FWBO day, the equivalent of what we're doing today. Yeah? And this was a group of people who were performing uh, a piece. Uh, the, the website says this is called the, the, Brotherhood of, the Brotherhood of Man, or I think they're called. Uh, no, no, the Cosmic Brotherhood. That's what they're called, the Cosmic Brotherhood, which actually is an older jazz band from the 50s, so I don't quite see the correlation. But they are just going for it. They are just expressing themselves. Yeah, they're just letting out their joy at what True Atma has offered on this day. They're not concerned about anything. They just let it out. And I just think that's marvellous. So if anyone feels the urge to sort of get up and start, please, maybe, maybe after I've finished. <laughs> uh, the only thing in here that indicates it's Buddhist, possibly, is the fact that the the person in the centre of the image has got a mala around her neck, which is sort of flailing about. 
next to the hierography on the, <laughs> the, the woman there in the jacket. Hierography, you know, with her hair just... I whip my hair back and forth, I whip yeah. my hair back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could have put artists making something here, but we've seen that. Yeah? These are artists in their own way too. The arts are very much part of Tree right now. This one speaks for itself, and yes, Nagashuri, you are there. Can you see where you are, Nagashuri? I think this one really speaks for itself. We are incredibly diverse. Just really think about this for a minute. It's hard for us in the West to really consider the impact of this image. Men and women, East and West, various ethnicities, various castes, people from various levels of education, academic backgrounds, uh, uh, economic backgrounds, all seated together, <coughs> equal. That is incredibly not only diverse, it's also uh, unique. Yeah? And worth celebrating. Uh, people in this room were ordained in India. Uh, Manu Chitta, you were ordained in India. Yeah? Uh, Dhammaraja, of course, also ordained in India. They're ordained together, in fact. <coughs> Speaking of uh, unique, Prakashika, do you know the, uh, the preceptor on the right? No. Uh, Dianandi. Thank you. I thought it might have been Dianandi. Uh, there wasn't any information on the website. A note to the website uh, people who may be watching. You might need to look at your notes uh, for the Tree Ratna Picture Library so we know who everyone is. Okay. Um, you probably also can't see it too well, but above the Ordinand, that's the person kneeling, is a, a statue of a thousand arm Navalokiteshvara who is a symbol of our order as well. Or uh, there's a Shakyamuni Buddha behind her head. I think that's wonderful. You've got the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara above her head. You've got Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, behind her. And in front of her, you have an image of Sangharachada. It's like her head has a triangle of blessing around it. Mm. Yeah? It's astonishing. And the look on her face is of, of just, I don't know. I, I can't put it into words. You can put it in your own words. But what's significant about this image is how radical it is. These are women ordaining women in the Buddhist world. And, it, and these women have the same precepts and status and responsibilities and practices as the men. Now in the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, that isn't always the case, where women do get ordained women. This is incredibly radical, and it's something that needs to be seen and needs to be acknowledged more than it has been in the past. This is an image of uh, the order seated at a convention, an order convention. We have a processional way leading up to what appears to be a big mandala. And the mandala is made up of what well, appears to be four arrows pointing to the centre. I don't know if you can see that. With a stupa in the centre. And beyond that, further up, we have a statue of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha. There's a wonderful vector line, a projection line, of the pathway leading through the mandala, through the, st the stupa in the centre, towards the Buddha himself. And this really is a sense of direction for our practice here in Tri Ratna. That sense of moving from one place, moving through a process of change in the mandala, through a process of transformation, of integration, and the other ways of practice that we have in Tri Ratna, moving closer and closer and closer, renouncing, letting go, and moving towards the Buddha himself and what he attained. So we in Tri Ratna have a path laid out for us that is very clear. We only need to walk it.
So that that's a gold Buddha, as you may you may see, and it's on a lake. This image uh, is redolent of the story of the Buddha who said, after he'd received his meal from his last meal before enlightenment from um, Sujata, uh, he ate the bowl of milk rice uh, and he took the bowl, which is recorded as being a golden bowl uh, in the in the story. And he said, "If I am to attain enlightenment this day, may this bowl go upstream." And he placed it in the water. And the bowl, the heavy gold bowl, floated upstream. Now, myths aside, and I do love a good myth, we do go against the stream. We do something that is completely miraculous here. What we do in Tarantino is quite miraculous. We're saying the world is lovely, the world is also suffering, the world is in pain, the world is beautiful. And we are going to be in the world, but we're not going to be of it. We're going to go against the trends of society. We're going to acknowledge them and we're going to see that they are a technique that people hold on to as a raft in their own way. But we want to challenge that and say perhaps there are other ways that you can live your life. This one may be a posed photo. So um, that, the man in the dress, or well, could be a Greek man's, uh, I really don't know what he was wearing. Uh, this is a man called Lokabandu, who is a great, uh, oh, he's such a hero to me in many ways, dressed as a jester at a Buddha field festival. And he's holding a sign for the Dharma parlor. Now, let's say uh, play on words, for those of you who don't know, a Dharma parlor, P-A-L-A, P-A-L-A, Dhamma, Dhamma, D-A-M-M-A, P-A-L-A. Dhamma Pala is a fierce protector of the Dharma that you find outside temples. Usually these scary looking demon guys with swords and weapons and things. They're a little bit like um, gargoyles on churches. They have that kind of role of protecting anyone who walks through the doors. And they're very kind of vicious looking. Lokabandu, not so much. <laughs> yeah. He's really a jester. He's playful. He is funny, but he is deep. There is a deep strength to that man that sees things on a very spiritual level. And here at Buddhafield, you go to the Dharma parlor, which, you know, the parlor in Britain is like the, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Brits in the room, I do apologize. It's, isn't that where one sits and has one's tea with, you know, when the vicar comes around and, <laughs> and you have the best china? And I, why am I looking at you, Ari Dunn? This is not your generation, is it? I don't know what a parlor is. You don't know what a parlor is? Okay. <laughs> Maybe I've watched no, too many e <laughs> Maybe I've watched too many episodes of Keeping Up Appearances. Um, and so the idea of, you know, one sits and has polite conversation over tea. Well, you don't have polite conversation over tea in the Dharma parlor. You learn the Dharma. You sit there and you listen and you learn and you play and you laugh and you realize what the Dharma has to offer you. It isn't all serious studying over books. Yeah? These are the four great kings of Indian and Tibetan uh, uh, legend and myth. They each have certain items that they carry. They are very similar to the Dhammapalas. They are protectors of the four directions. Uh, they're also often quite fierce looking and they appear again around temples uh, and they appear in stories and uh, they can be invoked and called upon to protect people who practice. But these ones are unusual because they're actually depicted as the four kings of the old uh, English kingdoms of you know, uh, Wessex and Northumbria and East Anglia and the other one I can't remember. So apologies to anyone living there. And so what we have here is a kind of, the fact that we're a very syncretic tradition. Syncretic means when you take different traditions and you bring them into alignment together. So the ancient English traditions have been brought in along with those Indian traditions, Indo-Tibetan traditions, and moved forward together. And this has happened all the way through Buddhist tradition. Yeah. I suppose most notably in Tibet, where we had the Tibetan traditions, met the early Indian teachers, and moved forward in a particular direction. 
Uh, but that goes back to the Buddha's time, when a man called uh, Sigala was worshipping the six directions in his pre-Buddhist sort of Brahmanistic way. And the Buddha said, yeah, do that. But do it this way. <laughs> Inviting him to take the existing tradition and what the Buddha was saying and bringing that together into a powerful six-fold path. So we in Tri Ratna are continuing that tradition of blending things from our time and our cultures and finding where they meet well and moving those together. Oh yes, and we're also practitioners. <laughs> we also meditate. And we do so uh, intensely, as we've seen earlier. I think this is taken in Stockholm. So we're also practitioners, but we're also incredibly creative. That is a Buddha made out of wicker. So again, secretic, bringing other traditions folk art and older traditions, and meeting Buddhism in the same way. That was at a Buddhafield festival. Dabamati, were you at that one? I don't remember. No. Okay. Yeah, amazing. So we have an opportunity in Triratna to be very creative, to really bring together and make new things, not just create and recreate and retell the same talks or retell the same teachings or redraw the same Buddhas. We have an opportunity to do something that is creative, but grounded in the basics of the tradition. Yeah. And every time you sit with your mind, you're being creative. When you meditate, you're being creative. Even if you're working against painful things, difficult things, you're still being creative. Deconstructing so you can create. Which reminds me of Ari Dharma's artwork. How many times do you have to deconstruct one of your works to repaint the work? Aren't you always scraping things away and starting again? Oh, yeah. 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 He's a stupa again. It's an illuminated stupa at a Waterfield festival. A beacon glowing in the darkness. That's who we are. A beacon of transformation growing in the darkness. It's amazing how evocative it can be to sit around a campfire and know that the shadows are behind you, but you're safe. Maybe that's who we are as well. There's a magical thing about Tree Ratna too, if you really embrace it and open up to it. And don't have to think it into submission. I have to say that again. We are thinkers, but we don't have to think everything into submission. There's more going on than there are thoughts about things. Just because you can name something doesn't mean that you know it. That's where magic comes in. For those of you who don't know, this was uh, at the funeral of Sangharajda. And I don't have any words for that one. Is that what I want? Uh, what you're seeing is... Uh, there's a, a massive glow of the sun setting uh, over the grave. And there does appear to be uh, a shimmer of rainbow in the sky over the grave. And that's uh, Sadaloka walking up the stairs there. is also taken at the funeral. When we're at our best, when we're at our best, we support each other when we're in pain. When we're at our best. When we're at our best, there's a phone call when you're sick. When we're at our best, there's a text saying, good on you, that was great. When we're at our best, hey, you want to come see a gallery show with me? When we're at our best, there's someone to listen. Sometimes that support may not be there. And we need to be reminded of that. Because we have such a potential to be there to lift other people up even when they're suffering or when they're in grief. It doesn't take a lot to reach out.
back to black and white. Anyone see, recognize that little baby face on the left? <laughs> That's Dharma Kamara. Yeah. And look at this, we've got Dharma Shalin, we've got men, women, uh, we've got someone dressed as a lion, lying together at a young person's event. These people are our legacy and Sangharachala's legacy into the future. Who knows how they will affect people as they have been affected by the order members and the tradition prior to them? What, what wonders will they be capable of? I'll make mistakes. But they are rooted in the tradition that we have and the way in which we do things. Uh, and they will be inventive and they'll be creative and they'll be innovative. And they'll lead us somewhere. Now, we need to trust them. Yeah? We have an opportunity to trust them. So, I'd like to leave you with this. This is actually a photo from uh, 1965. So it actually predates Tri Ratna. And uh, I'd like to play a little piece of to you, which I think, when you hear it, you actually hear in it... I believe the origin of what then the Western Buddhist order and now the True Atma Buddhist order really is about. Let's hope the sound all works for us. Now one's approach to Buddhism should also be balanced. This is another very important, another almost crucial point. Now what does one mean by balanced? Human nature, we know, has got very many aspects. Need not develop this theme particularly. There are emotional aspects, intellectual aspects. Some people are more introvert, others are more extrovert. In this way, there are so many differences. These differences are represented, incidentally, as many of you know, in Buddhism by the formula of the five spiritual faculties, which have been kept in balance. That is, faith and wisdom, representing the emotional and the intellectual, and then again, Meditation and energy, representing the introvert and extrovert, all balanced by mindfulness or awareness, which is the equilibrating faculty in man. So, Buddhism should be approached in all these ways. One shouldn't have just an emotional approach, or just an intellectual approach, or just a meditative approach, or just a, a practical or active approach. One's nature comprehends all these aspects. One feels, one thinks. One acts, one also sometimes sits still. There are all these aspects. So, one should approach Buddhism as it were with all these aspects, or through all these aspects, that is to say, with one's total being. Not just with a part of it. Not just trying to feel, and not think, or understand. Not just trying to understand, but not to feel. Not just all the time looking within, never looking without. And on the other hand, not always looking without and never pausing to look within. There is a time and place for all these things. It's possible we should try to do all of them all the time. As we ascend higher and higher in their spiritual development, we shall tend more and more to do all of these all the time, to think and to feel, to act and not to act simultaneously. It sounds impossible, but that's only because of the limitations of our present way of thinking. Eventually, as one's spiritual life develops, all these four, apparently contradictory, are sort of fused and harmonized into one spiritual faculty, one being, as it were, which is forging a hint. So this is the Triatna Buddhist community in summary for what I've shared today. And I wonder which ones you experience most. And that is what I wanted to share with you today, an untold history of Tri Ratna that hopefully gives you a doorway uh, and gives you some sense of faith and confidence in what we are doing here. And I'd like to thank you and I also acknowledge that the new Mitras who are going to be joining us today, this is what you are supporting. And I hope that sits well with you. So thank you everybody.